Um, what I'd like to do is just give everyone, I guess, a little bit of a feel of, of what we're doing um, here in Australia with the Animal Born System Program or Animal Born Sensor Program, um, and then how that kind of fits in with the, the broader Goose, so the Global Ocean Observing Network Anibos that we have, um, and how that might help us uh, or how that might feed into, um, I guess, an integrated system of observing uh, as part of the, the SUS initiative and, and where we can go uh, with this in, in designing a, a system that allows us to, to observe in all areas, um, I guess, with the emphasis on the fact that um, if we're going to be successful in observing the oceans um, and the Southern Ocean in particular here, we need some sort of integrated complementary system and hopefully um, uh, after this, uh, you'll have a, a nice idea of, I guess, the contribution that um, that the animals can make to, to that vision. Um, I'll skip through the slides relatively quickly um, because many of you have probably seen it uh, before, but if, if there are specific questions, then, then please do sing out. Um, and the other thing is that, uh, like Danny said afterwards, we've got a couple of um, sort of questions, comments, and I, I think... Um, we really value your input into, into those two points, because I think that's really going to help um, drive where we go with the actual design of, of the system. So I'll get on to that. Um, like, like Danny said, my name's Clive McMahon. I, I work at the uh, Sydney Institute of Marine Science, where I run the, the IMOS um, animal tagging program. Our main focus is to attach um, miniaturized CTDs to um, to animals, primarily in the Southern Ocean. We do some tropical work uh, in Northern Australia um, on turtles, but our main focus is uh, attaching the instruments to seals uh, in the Southern Ocean. Um, just briefly, uh, the Anibos Network was uh, endorsed by Goost Global Ocean uh, Observing System in 2020, and um, as a, a UN decade uh, project in, in 2021. Um, primarily, we collect uh, subsurface temperature and conductivity uh, measurements, um, of course, related to, to, to water column structure. Um, I'm not going to read through our, our vision and our mission. This is uh, all in our, um, our paper published a couple of years ago in uh, Frontiers in Marine Science. If, if anybody wants a copy of that, uh, please sing out and I'll happily... Um, give that to you. So a lot of the information I'm, I'm going to present here is actually in that paper. So um, don't get too caught up, um, I guess, in the detail. But, you know, overall, what we're trying to do is we're trying to collect um, good information from the Southern Ocean in particular and make that freely available to, to, it, to the community. So I will add here that, um, that the IMOS vision is that all of the data we collect are made um, freely available to, to the community all of the time. So that's um, both in real time and in delayed mode. So the real time data tends to go through the GTS um, and, and is available on World Ocean Database um, and delayed mode data is made available on um, the AODN site, which is the Australian Ocean Data Network um, and also on MEOP. Um, again, the sort of details of that uh, are in our paper. Um, just briefly, what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to provide um, good information to the community that meets, uh, that meets our societal and scientific needs to understand climate and the ocean. Um, of course, we want to set priorities for, for integrated um, observing systems, expanding that system to, to be more global and complementary. Um, we like to think of what we're doing as, as cost effective, yeah, the, the cost of the instruments on the animals, while, while still relatively expensive, are, are cheap in comparison to, to many of the other um, hardware that we would put in the ocean. And of course, we want to do this um, and make the data available to, to everybody, uh, specifically um, coastal communities that are probably most vulnerable to, to changes in, um, in the ocean structure through sea level rise, um, etc. How do we do this? Um, it's fairly straightforward. Um, this is probably not uh, hugely, um, <clears throat> or this is probably not great news to, to many of you. Um, we have a miniaturized instrument. So we've taken um, 
a, a rosette that you might stick on, you know, stick over the side of a, a ship. It's been miniaturized to, to a, a relatively small instrument that weighs about 580 grams um, that we're able to attach to, to seals and, and turtles. Um, there's a whole lot of sort of pre-calibration uh, preparation of the instruments that happens in the lab. They then go off into the field, um, get uh, attached to animals, and the animals then go off into the ocean. And each time they surface, um, they'll, they'll uh, send through the Argos constellation uh, information back through Toulouse um, onto the Sea Mammal Research Unit in Scotland, uh, where the information is decoded and um, it's then made available to, to the community through the, the GTS, so the, the Global Telecommunication System. Um, in real time, these data are used uh, for, for operational forecast purposes and in delayed mode um, for more kind of research applications. Oops. There we go. Um, just kind of where and, and, and what we're doing. I think um, the, the really important thing uh, on this slide is, is really, um, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but um, you can see from the, the figure in the top left there that um, we do cover a large part of the ocean. Um, and the little figure on the right really shows where we're concentrating our observations and, and where we're concentrating our effort. And that's mainly in, uh, in the polar regions. And, and essentially what we have there is the, the blue line is the, uh, the contribution that the, the, the contribution, the profile contribution that the animals are making. Um, and, and in the polar regions, um, by far, the, the most uh, profiles being returned are, are from animals and not from the, the other um, systems. Um, our main focus has been uh, a, a time series, a building a time series in the Southern Indian Ocean. And um, I'm very happy to report that um, the last of our CTD tags went out uh, a couple of weeks ago from, um, from Eels Cadulin in the Southern Indian Ocean. And, uh, and we're very proud of, of this effort because this year represents um, the 20th uh, deployment. So we have a 20 year time series uh, this year and, um, and we're, we're very pleased with that and, and we're hoping that that'll continue. So um, in the Southern Indian Ocean, we have now a, uh, a 20 year time series of, of continuous sampling. Um, those, uh, those red boxes in the um, in the top left-hand um, figure really just show uh, Australia's contribution, but um, you can see that, you know, we're, we're getting circumpolar coverage uh, in the Antarctic or the Southern Ocean, and, um, and we're getting some really nice coverage uh, in, in the Northern Hemisphere too, with little bits and pieces now uh, starting to dribble in from the tropics, um, but I'm not gonna go into that too much here. Um, the, the bottom panel of, of the figure really just shows kind of, you know, uh, like the observing systems, one system isn't um, going to, to cover all of our needs. So different animals in different regions will, will provide the information that we need. So, you know, we, we, we're not going to stick things to, um, to fish in the Antarctic. Um, we're going to use seals there. Um, you know, we, we use turtles and, and, and sharks and, and, and other animals for, for the tropical observations. Um, our main sort of focus is collecting, like I mentioned, conductivity and temperature, but we are, we are also able to, um, to, to sort of design and, and um, I guess tailor the instruments to collect other information, fluorometry, light, um, dissolved oxygen, um, wind pressure, and, and various other bits and pieces that, that help us, um, I guess, observe the ocean in, in, in more detail, but the core program is the um, conductivity, temperature, depth profiles. This is just a, a little bit of a, a, a slide to, to kind of, I guess, give everyone a, a feel for, for what we're, we're doing and, and where we're going with this. So um, I mentioned we have a core program, which is the, um, the CTD program, um, with some other bits and pieces coming on after. So fluorometry, uh, light oxygen, um, we have accelerometry and a, and a magnetometer, um, so we can look at orientation and, and we can uh, reconstruct movements of animals underwater. There's some passive acoustic measurements. Um, there's, there's high resolution uh, information. So the instruments are bigger on those. Um, we, we tend uh, not to use too many of them, but they do 
uh, they, they do have a, a, a sort of a niche that um, that we're, we're looking at. And then um, more recently, we've got some active acoustics uh, where we're attaching a, a, a sonar pinger um, and integrating that with the instrument um, to look at prey fields um, and integrate uh, feeding behavior and prey fields with um, physical structure uh, in the ocean. So I think that's a really nice example of actually uh, quantifying performance uh, of the animals directly relevant to, to the structure of the ocean um, to, to provide a more synthetic view of, of um, I guess, the environment and how that affects uh, behavior and, um, and animal populations. This is just a, a, a little slide to, to show um, our core area of, of operation from the Australian um, sector. So uh, here you can see the, um, the, the focus in the Southern Indian Ocean. Um, and, and a little bit of focus towards the Southern Pacific. We're hoping that as part of the new um, East Antarctic Monitoring Program uh, that the Australian Antarctic Division is running, that we'll be able to, to sort of fill that gap um, in, in sort of the more Eastern sector of, of the Antarctic um, a bit better and, and start building a time series uh, from Macquarie Island as well, which will give us, you know, really nice coverage towards the Ross Sea and, and then um, a little further uh, to to the west from there. So um, you know this is just a, a conglomerate of of all the tracks over over the last um, twenty years, really. And this represents um, probably in the order of of, of six or, or seven hundred um, uh, animals carrying instruments. Um, I will say here that uh, the the Argos transmissions allow uh, a, a return of about. Um, four CTD profiles per tag per day. Um, so we do amass enormous amounts of information um, quite quickly each year as, as we deploy the instruments. And I'll talk a little bit about that in terms of how it fits in with the, the sort of broader observing systems um, or, or observing network uh, when I talk about um, some of the effects of the the pandemic on, on goose. Um, I'm, I'm gonna skip through these really quickly. This is just to show you that we do get some really nice data um, from, from those various integrated um, sensors on, on the tags. So here's some, some uh, you know, just some images of, of the fluorometry. Of course, fluorometry on its own doesn't um, tell you everything. You kind of need to integrate light into that to, to get a better idea of, um, of the actual chlorophyll and, and the biological activity in the water column and, and adding light, of course, gives you a much better idea about that. So, um, you know, I guess don't get too caught up in the detail, but, you know, we, we, we get some really nice, nice measurements from that. This work is largely led by our um, French colleagues uh, at CNRS in, in Chizé, Christophe Guinet and, and his group, um, who we've been working closely with um, over the last couple of decades. Um, dissolved oxygen, uh, one of those things that, um, that we'd all really like to measure in the ocean, but is actually not as easy as we'd like, to, like it to be. We've had um, two bites at the cherry on this. Uh, there were some early deployments um, of, of an optode. Um, it worked relatively well. Um, so that pink box is, is just the area up above there. So you, you do get some nice information. Um, but there were some some significant issues with with drift and calibration uh, of of those um, sensors. Uh, so we sort of abandoned that program. And if you think back to that little timeline, you would have seen a gap in the dissolved oxygen measurements. Um, so we've had another bash at it. Oops. Here we go. Um, and this just. Um, some data from, from a new uh, sensor that, that's been um, attached to a, a new oxygen, dissolved oxygen sensor that's been attached. Um, these are still raw data, so they, they do look a little bit messy, um, but this is kind of hot off the press, really. Um, this is some work done by, by Christoph and his colleagues um, from Peninsula Valdez in, in Argentina, um, and, and it's looking really promising, um, the, the data that are being returned. So. I think the, the key message here is, is watch this space um, and, and hopefully there'll, there'll be some nice information coming out fairly soon um, describing the, the new um, oxygen sensors and, and what we can do with those. So um, I think this holds um, some really nice promise for us. Uh, one of the things perhaps uh, a little bit um, to, to the side here is that um, 
here in Australia, we've been leading a project to, to use the animal dive depths and, and animal behavior. Many of the, the seals are benthic divers um, to, to look and map bathymetry. So some early work by uh, Laurie Padman and, and Dan Costa off the um, uh, West Antarctic Peninsula showed that, that diving behavior and dive depths can be used really successfully to, to map bathymetry. Those are the, the top two panels of the, the figure there. Uh, more recently, this is a paper we have in review at the moment. We've taken um, all of the dives from the East Antarctic uh, sector where we have information, the red bits uh, in, in those two panels are where the seals are diving deeper than um, the, the, the interpolations or, or the bathymetric products. Um, so there's there are lots of areas uh, where, where that's happening. Um, the bottom panel is, is um, an area uh, around Casey Station, the Vanderford Glacier. Um, in about 2010, we had uh, an instrument attached to, to a seal and the seal was consistently diving uh, more than a thousand meters deeper than, um, uh, I'll, it's the wrong word, but the known bathymetry, what I'm, I'm getting at there is, is the prediction or the, the interpolation of bathymetry in that reason, region. Um, we, we were quite concerned about that. We thought that um, we were having problems with the, the actual pressure sensors. Um, turns out that uh, the Australian, the new Australian um, Antarctic vessel, the new Ina, uh, managed to do a multi-beam survey there a couple of years ago, and lo and behold, discovered this um, this very deep trench of the the Vanderford Glacier, and this um, really led us to to pursuing this idea of can we use um, animals to map in more detail bathymetry, and and it turns out um, we can do that. So. Hopefully I'll be able to share with the community um, our, our paper on this in the not too distant future. But I think this is a, a really exciting development for us because um, bathymetry is such a key to understanding the, um, the processes, uh, or, you know, the, sort of the oceanographic processes around the Antarctic coast and, and also the interface between ice and, and, um, and, and water, so the ocean. So um, uh, we're, we're really excited about this component. And, and I think... Um, this this is really going to start a, a whole new um, area of, of, I guess, observing for us. I will add here to the side that um, some folks in Scotland, off the west coast of Scotland, are using skates uh, to, to map bathymetry, and a group in the US are using cormorants to, to do the same thing. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of promise um, in the animal-born sensor world to, to look at bathymetry. And given we know, you know, um, uh, less than a quarter of the world's oceans have, have been mapped properly um, or in detail, perhaps not so much properly, but in detail. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot of work for us to do in, in that space. And I think animals can help. Here, just um, a brief uh, sort of description of, of the sonar technology and integrating animal behavior with that. We were able to detect um, quite nicely prey fields uh, in the water column, and we can look at, at both seasonal and annual shifts in, in that um, productivity and relate that to, um, to water column structure. Um, primarily the work we did in that bottom panel was looking at, at seal behind. No. But again, um, probably not for us to to dwell on too much here, um, you know, Antarctica is, is fantastically interesting and important, um, but the, the tropics and subtropics are, are important too. And, and as, as part of the broader ANIBOS program, um, there, there's a, a big push to, to observe um, these tropical and, and subtropical oceans. Uh, we're using turtles primarily as, um, as the animals to, catch our, uh, to capture our system here. And I just want to give you a, a, a little um, video here of, of a recent set of, oops, I'm sorry, uh, deployments um, in Northern Australia on, on flatback turtles, just to give you an idea of the kind of coverage we get um, from turtles. So, so they too move around um, and, and will return and, and well collect and, and return data via the, the Argos system. So we get some really nice spread um, across uh, Northern Australia. Um, and, and of course, you know, understanding what's happening in the tropics, um, they're, they're poorly observed, but, but animals are helping us uh, deal with that. 
So I guess this is really the nub of where we're going to go. We want to have an integrated system um, that, that serves uh, all of our purposes and provides information across a broad spatial and, and temporal scale. Um, animals can do this uh, with our miniaturized in, uh, instrumentation and they can help us sustain observing systems. Um, and, and this is kind of, I guess, the, the point I was trying to make a little earlier on. Uh, Tim Boyer out of NOAA has led an initiative and, and this work has just been published in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. Um, I guess really discussing the vulnerability of, of the global ocean um, observing system to things like the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, when people can't move around, um, we're, we're unable to service many of the instruments that we need uh, for, for returning instrument, uh, for returning uh, observations. Um, the systems that are, are reliant on, on people more directly, you know, uh, deploying Argo from ships or, or servicing mooring lines are more vulnerable than, than some of the other systems. And I think, um, you know, what, what came out of uh, this work was that that animal born system is, is fairly robust because quite often um, animals are, are, are accessible uh, from, from sort of locations where, where people can still be with, without the vulnerabilities of, of movement and, and sort of restricting interaction um, or, or movements of people around the globe. Um, of course, a, a major problem for all of these systems are, are, are those things uh, of production of, of, of sensors and chips. But um, I think the, the main message or the take home message here really is that, um, that if we want a, uh, a continuous uh, sampling or observing system, we need to use all of the tools at our disposal, and, and that includes things like animals and, and all of the other systems. Um, it's not a one size fits all. I think, um, you know, perhaps here, you know, the diversity and um, it, it, I guess a, a diverse system is going to be the one that, that's most resilient. And um, I guess just to use a, a biological, um, you know, analogy, um, for systems or populations to be resilient, you, you rely on diversity across those populations. Um, and I, I think if we apply that same thinking to ocean observing, we'll, we'll, um, we'll be doing well because that's going to allow us to, to keep doing what we want to do and, and to do it well. Um, and so, yes, here just uh, towards an enhanced, and I guess what I really mean here is an integrated um, and, and a pep, perhaps you can even change um, enhanced and integrated with a, you know, a synthetic observing system. Um, we do need to, to use all of the, the systems. Um, they all complement one another. Like I said, it's not a one size fits all. Um, I think the community is, is, um, is mature enough to recognize that um, if we want to do good work, we, we need to be, be creative and we need to be inclusive in, in what we're doing. So thanks very much, um, everybody. I think we'll, I'll leave that there. Um, I will just uh, like to say that, of course, you know, this work is um, uh, relies on, on the collaboration of, of many people and, and institutes. Um, some of them are recognized there. And um, I think perhaps now we can, can open up the discussion um, with those two key points we have. Hopefully everybody received the email with, with those two points. So, Thanks, everyone, and uh, I'll pass over to Danny. Great. Yeah.